Section four of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine. Yes, Mr. Banks said, watching him go, it was a thousand pities. Lily had said something about his frightening her. He changed from one mood to another so suddenly. Yes, said Mr. Banks, it was a thousand pities that Ramsay could not behave a little more like other people for he liked Lily Briscoe, he could discuss Ramsay with her quite openly. It was for that reason, he said, that the young don't read Carlyle. A crusty old grumbler who lost his temper if the porridge was cold, why should he preach to us? was what Mr. Banks understood that young people said nowadays. It was a thousand pities if you thought, as he did, that Carlyle was one of the great teachers of mankind. Lily was ashamed to say that she had not read Carlyle since she was at school. But in her opinion one liked Mr. Ramsay all the better for thinking that if his little finger ached the whole world must come to an end. It was not that she minded. For who could be deceived by him? He asked you quite openly to flatter him, to admire him. His little dodges deceived nobody. What she disliked was his narrowness his blindness, she said, looking after him. "'A bit of a hypocrite,' Mr. Banks suggested, looking too at Mr. Ramsay's back, for was he not thinking of his friendship, and of Cam refusing to give him a flower, and of all those boys and girls, and his own house, full of comfort, but, since his wife's death, quiet rather? Of course he had his work. All the same he rather wished Lily to agree that Ramsay was as he said, a bit of a hypocrite. Lily Briscoe went on putting away her brushes, looking up, looking down. Looking up, there he was, Mr. Ramsay, advancing towards them, swinging, careless, oblivious, remote. A bit of a hypocrite, she repeated. Oh, no, the most sincere of men, the truest, here he was, the best, but looking down, she thought, he is absorbed in himself, he is tyrannical, he is unjust, and kept looking down, purposely, for only so could she keep steady, staying with the Ramses. Directly one looked up and saw them, what she called being in love flooded them. They became part of that unreal but penetrating and exciting universe which is the world seen through the eyes of love. The sky stuck to them, the birds sang through them, and, what was even more exciting, she felt too, as she saw Mr. Ramsay bearing down and retreating, and Mrs. Ramsay sitting with James in the window, and the cloud moving and the tree bending, how life, from being made up of little separate incidents which one lived one by one, became curled and whole like a wave which bore one up and threw one down with it there, with a dash on the beach. Mr. Banks expected her to answer. And she was about to say something criticising Mrs. Ramsay, how she was alarming too, in her way, high-handed, or words to that effect, when Mr. Banks made it entirely unnecessary for her to speak by his rapture. For such it was, considering his age, turned sixty, and his cleanliness and his impersonality, and the white scientific coat which seemed to clothe him. For him to gaze as Lily saw him gazing at Mrs. Ramsay was a rapture, equivalent, Lily felt, to the loves of dozens of young men. And perhaps Mrs. Ramsay had never excited the loves of dozens of young men. It was love, she thought, pretending to move her canvas, distilled and filtered, love that never attempted to clutch its object. but like the love which mathematicians bear their symbols, or poets their phrases, was meant to be spread over the world, and become part of the human gain. So it was indeed. The world by all means should have shared it, could Mr. Banks have said why that woman pleased him so, why the sight of her reading a fairy tale to her boy had upon him precisely the same effect as the solution of a scientific problem, so that he rested in contemplation of it and felt, as he felt when he had proved something absolute about the digestive system of plants, that barbarity was tamed, 
the reign of chaos subdued. Such a rapture, for by what other name could one call it, made Lily Briscoe forget entirely what she had been about to say. It was nothing of importance, something about Mrs. Ramsay. It paled beside this rapture, this silent stare, for which she felt intense gratitude, for nothing so solaced her, eased her of the perplexity of life, and miraculously raised its burdens, as this sublime power, this heavenly gift, and one would no more disturb it, while it lasted, than break up the shaft of sunlight lying level across the floor. That people should love like this, that Mr. Banks should feel this for Mrs. Ramsay, she glanced at him, musing, was helpful, was exulting. She wiped one brush after another upon a piece of old rag, menially, on purpose. She took shelter from the reverence which covered all women, she felt herself praised. Let him gaze, she would steal a look at her picture. She could have wept. It was bad, it was bad, it was infinitely bad. She could have done it differently, of course. The colour could have been thinned and faded, the shapes etherealized. That was how Ponsfort would have seen it. But then she did not see it like that. She saw the colour burning on a framework of steel, the light of a butterfly's wing lying upon the arches of a cathedral. Of all that only a few random marks scrawled upon the canvas remained. And it would never be seen, never be hung even, and there was Mr. Tansley whispering in her ear, "'Women can't paint, women can't write.' She now remembered what she had been going to say about Mrs. Ramsay. She did not know how she would have put it, but it would have been something critical. She had been annoyed the other night by some high-handedness. Looking along the level of Mr. Banks's glance at her, she thought that no woman could worship another woman in the way he worshipped. They could only seek shelter under the shade which Mr. Banks extended over them both. Looking along his beam she added to it her different ray, thinking that she was unquestionably the loveliest of people, bowed over her book, the best, perhaps, but also different, too, from the perfect shape which one saw there. But why different? And how different, she asked herself, scraping her palette of all those mounds of blue and green, which seemed to her like clods with no life in them now, yet she vowed she would inspire them, force them to move, flow, do her bidding to-morrow. How did she differ? What was the spirit in her, the essential thing, by which, had you found a crumpled glove in the corner of a sofa, you would have known it? from its twisted finger, hers indisputably. She was like a bird for speed, an arrow for directness. She was willful, she was commanding. Of course, Lily reminded herself, I am thinking of her relations with women, and I am much younger, an insignificant person, living off the Brompton Road. She opened bedroom windows, she shut doors. So she tried to start the tune of Mrs. Ramsay in her head. Arriving late at night, with a light tap on one's bedroom door, wrapped in an old fur coat, for the setting of her beauty was always that, hasty but apt, she would enact again whatever it might be, Charles Tansley losing his umbrella, Mr. Carmichael snuffling and sniffing, Mr. Banks saying, the vegetable salts are lost. All this she would adroitly shape, even maliciously twist and, moving over to the window, in pretence that she must go, it was dawn, she could see the sun rising, half turn back, more intimately, but still always laughing, insist that she must, Minter must, they all must marry, since in the whole world whatever laurels might be tossed to her, but Mrs. Ramsay cared not a fig for her painting, or triumphs won by her, probably Mrs. Ramsay had had her share of those and here she saddened, darkened, and came back to her chair. There could be no disputing this. An unmarried woman—she lightly took her hand for a moment—an unmarried woman has missed the best of life. The house seemed full of children sleeping, and Mrs. Ramsay listening, shaded lights and regular breathing. 
Oh, but, Lily would say, there was her father, her home, even, had she dared to say it, her painting. But all this seemed so little, so virginal, against the other. Yet, as the night wore on, and white lights parted the curtains, and even now and then some bird chirped in the garden, gathering a desperate courage she would urge her own exemption from the universal law, plead for it. She liked to be alone, she liked to be herself, she was not made for that, and so have to meet a serious stare from eyes of unparalleled depth, and confront Mrs. Ramsay's simple certainty, and she was childlike now, that her dear Lily, her little brisk, was a fool. Then, she remembered, she had laid her head on Mrs. Ramsay's lap, and laughed and laughed and laughed, laughed almost hysterically at the thought of Mrs. Ramsay presiding with immutable calm over destinies which she completely failed to understand. There she sat, simple, serious. She had recovered her sense of her now, this was the glove's twisted finger. But into what sanctuary had one penetrated? Lily Briscoe had looked up at last, and there was Mrs. Ramsay, unwitting entirely what had caused her laughter, still presiding, but now with every trace of wilfulness abolished, and, in its stead, something clear as the space which the clouds at last uncover, the little space of sky which sleeps beside the moon. Was it wisdom? Was it knowledge? Was it, once more, the deceptiveness of beauty, so that all one's perceptions, halfway to truth, were tangled in a golden mesh? Or did she lock up within her some secret, which certainly Lily Briscoe believed people must have for the world to go on at all? Every one could not be as helter-skelter, hand-to-mouth as she was. But if they knew, could they tell one what they knew? Sitting on the floor with her arms round Mrs. Ramsay's knees, close as she could get, smiling to think that Mrs. Ramsay would never know the reason of that pressure, she imagined how, in the chambers of the mind and heart of the woman who was, physically touching her, were stood, like the treasures in the tombs of kings, tablets bearing sacred inscriptions, which, if one could spell them out, would teach one everything, but they would never be offered openly never made public. What art was there, known to love or cunning, by which one pressed through into those secret chambers? What device for becoming, like waters poured into one jar, inextricably the same, one with the object one adored? Could the body achieve, or the mind, subtly mingling in the intricate passages of the brain, or the heart, could loving, as people called it, make her and Mrs. Ramsay one? For it was not knowledge, but unity that she desired, not inscriptions on tablets, nothing that could be written in any language known to men, but intimacy itself, which is knowledge, she had thought, leaning her head on Mrs. Ramsay's knee. Nothing happened, nothing, nothing, as she leant her head against Mrs. Ramsay's knee and yet she knew knowledge and wisdom were stored up in Mrs. Ramsay's heart. How, then, she had asked herself, did one know one thing or another thing about people, sealed as they were? Only like a bee, drawn by some sweetness or sharpness in the air, intangible to touch or taste, one haunted the dome-shaped hive, ranged the wastes of the air over the countries of the world alone, and then haunted the hives with their murmurs and their stirrings, the hives which were people. Mrs. Ramsay rose, Lily rose, Mrs. Ramsay went. For days there hung about her, as after a dream some subtle change is felt in the person one has dreamt of, more vividly than anything she said, the sound of murmuring, and, as she sat in the wicker armchair in the drawing-room window, she wore, to Lily's eyes, an august shape, the shape of a dome. This ray passed level with Mr. Banks's ray straight to Mrs. Ramsay, sitting reading there with James at her knee. But now, while she still looked, Mr. Banks had done. He had put on his spectacles, 
He had stepped back. He had raised his hand. He had slightly narrowed his clear blue eyes, when Lily, rousing herself, saw what he was at, and winced like a dog who sees a hand raised to strike it. She would have snatched her picture off the easel, but she said to herself, one must. She braced herself to stand the awful trial of someone looking at her picture. One must, she said, one must. And, if it must be seen, Mr. Banks was less alarming than another. But that any other eyes should see the residue of her thirty-three years, the deposit of each day's living mixed with something more secret than she had ever spoken or shown in the course of all those days, was an agony. At the same time, it was immensely exciting. Nothing could be cooler and quieter. Taking out a penknife, Mr. Banks tapped the canvas with the bone handle. What did she wish to indicate by the triangular purple shape, just there? he asked. It was Mrs. Ramsay reading to James, she said. She knew his objection, that no one could tell it for a human shape but she had made no attempt at likeness, she said. For what reason had she introduced them, then? he asked. Why, indeed, except that, if there, in that corner, it was bright, here, in this, she felt the need of darkness. Simple, obvious, commonplace as it was, Mr. Banks was interested. Mother and child, then, objects of universal veneration, and in this case the mother was famous for her beauty, might be reduced, he pondered, to a purple shadow without irreverence. But the picture was not of them, she said, or not in his sense. There were other senses, too, in which one might reverence them. By a shadow here and a light there, for instance. Her tribute took that form, if, as she vaguely supposed, a picture must be a tribute. A mother and child might be reduced to a shadow without irreverence. A light here required a shadow there. He considered. He was interested. He took it scientifically in complete good faith. The truth was that all his prejudices were on the other side, he explained. The largest picture in his dining-room, which painters had praised and valued at a higher price than he had given for it, was of the cherry-trees in blossom on the banks of the Kennet. He had spent his honeymoon on the banks of the Kennet, he said. Lily must come and see that picture, he said. But now, he turned, with his glasses raised, to the scientific examination of her canvas. The question being one of the relations of masses, of lights and shadows, which, to be honest, he had never considered before, he would like to have it explained. What, then, did she wish to make of it? And he indicated the scene before them. She looked. She could not show him what she wished to make of it, could not see it even herself, without a brush in her hand. She took up once more her old painting position, with the dim eyes and the absent-minded manner, subduing all her impressions as a woman to something much more general becoming once more under the power of that vision which she had seen clearly once, and must now grope for among hedges and houses and mothers and children, her picture. It was a question, she remembered, how to connect this mass on the right hand with that on the left. She might do it by bringing the line of the branch across so, or break the vacancy in the foreground by an object, James perhaps, so but the danger was that by doing that the unity of the whole might be broken. She stopped. She did not want to bore him. She took the canvas lightly off the easel. But it had been seen. It had been taken from her. This man had shared with her something profoundly intimate. And, thanking Mr. Ramsay for it, and Mrs. Ramsay for it, and the hour and the place, crediting the world with a power which she had not suspected, that one could walk away down that long gallery, not alone any more, but arm in arm with somebody, the strangest feeling in the world, and the most exhilarating. She nicked the catch of her paint-box, too, more firmly than was necessary, and the nick seemed to surround in a circle for ever the paint-box, the lawn, 
Mr. Banks, and that wild villain, Cam, dashing past. CHAPTER Ten. For Cam grazed the easel by an inch. She would not stop for Mr. Banks and Lily Briscoe, though Mr. Banks, who would have liked a daughter of his own, held out his hand. She would not stop for her father, whom she grazed also by an inch, nor for her mother, who called, "'Cam, I want you a moment,' as she dashed past. She was off like a bird, bullet or arrow, impelled by what desire, shot by whom, at what directed, who could say? What, what? Mrs. Ramsay pondered, watching her. It might be a vision, of a shell, of a wheelbarrow, of a fairy kingdom on the far side of the hedge, or it might be the glory of speed, no one knew. But when Mrs. Ramsay called, Cam! a second time, the projectile dropped in mid-career, and Cam came lagging back, pulling a leaf by the way, to her mother. What was she dreaming about, Mrs. Ramsay wondered, seeing her engrossed, as she stood there with some thought of her own, so that she had to repeat the message twice, ask Mildred if Andrew, Miss Doyle, and Mr. Rayleigh have come back. The words seemed to be dropped into a well, where, if the waters were clear, they were also so extraordinarily distorting that, even as they descended, one saw them twisting about to make heaven knows what pattern on the floor of the child's mind. What message would Cam give the cook, Mrs. Ramsay wondered? and indeed it was only by waiting patiently, and hearing that there was an old woman in the kitchen with very red cheeks drinking soup out of a basin, that Mrs. Ramsay at last prompted that parrot-like instinct which had picked up Mildred's words quite accurately, and could now produce them, if one waited, in a colourless sing-song. Shifting from foot to foot, Cam repeated the words. "'No, they haven't, and I've told Ellen to clear away tea.' Minter Doyle and Paul Rayleigh had not come back then. That could only mean, Mrs. Ramsay thought, one thing. She must accept him, or she must refuse him. This going off after luncheon for a walk, even though Andrew was with them, what could it mean? Except that she had decided, rightly, Mrs. Ramsay thought, and she was very, very fond of Minter, to accept that good fellow, who might not be brilliant. But then, thought Mrs. Ramsay, realising that James was tugging at her, to make her go on reading aloud the fisherman and his wife. She did in her own heart infinitely prefer boobies to clever men who wrote dissertations. Charles Tansley, for instance. Anyhow, it must have happened, one way or the other, by now. But she read. Next morning the wife awoke first, and it was just daybreak, and from her bed she saw the beautiful country lying before her. Her husband was still stretching himself. But how could Minta say now that she would not have him? Not if she agreed to spend whole afternoons traipsing about the country alone, for Andrew would be off after his crabs. But possibly Nancy was with them. She tried to recall the sight of them standing at the hall door after lunch. There they stood, looking at the sky, wondering about the weather. And she had said, thinking partly to cover their shyness, partly to encourage them to be off, for her sympathies were with Paul. There isn't a cloud anywhere within miles." At which she could feel little Charles Tansley, who had followed them out, snigger. But she did it on purpose. Whether Nancy was there or not she could not be certain, looking from one to the other in her mind's eye. She read on. "'Our wife,' said the man, "'why should we be king?' I do not want to be king." Well, said the wife, if you won't be king, I will. Go to the flounder, for I will be king. Come in or go out, Cam, she said, knowing that Cam was attracted only by the word flounder, and that in a moment she would fidget and fight with James as usual. Cam shut off. Mrs. Ramsay went on reading, relieved, for she and James shared the same tastes and were comfortable together. And when he came to the sea, it was quite dark grey, and the water heaved up from below and smelt putrid. Then he went and stood by it, and said, Flounder, flounder, in the sea, come, I pray thee, here to me, for my wife, good Ilsebil, wills not as I'd have her will. 
"'Well, what does she want, then?' said the flounder. And where were they now? Mrs. Ramsay wondered, reading and thinking quite easily both at the same time. For the story of the fisherman and his wife was like the bass gently accompanying a tune, which now and then ran up unexpectedly into the melody. And when should she be told? If nothing happened she would have to speak seriously to Minta, for she could not go traipsing about all over the country, even if Nancy were with them. She tried again, unsuccessfully, to visualise their backs going down the path, and to count them. She was responsible to Minta's parents, the owl and the poker. Her nicknames for them shot into her mind as she read. The owl and the poker, yes, they would be annoyed if they heard, and they were certain to hear, that Minta, staying with the Ramses, had been seen, etc., etc., etc. He wore a wig in the House of Commons, and she ably assisted him at the head of the stairs," she repeated, fishing them up out of her mind by a phrase which, coming back from some party, she had made to amuse her husband. "'Dear, dear,' Mrs. Ramsay said to herself, "'how did they produce this incongruous daughter, this tomboy Minter with a hole in her stocking? How did she exist in that portentous atmosphere? where the maid was always removing in a dustpan the sand that the parrot had scattered, and conversation was almost entirely reduced to the exploits, interesting perhaps but limited after all, of that bird. Naturally one had asked her to lunch, tea, dinner, finally to stay with them up at Finley, which had resulted in some friction with the owl, her mother, and more calling, and more conversation, and more sand, and really, at the end of it, she had told enough lies about parrots to last her a lifetime, so she had said to her husband that night, coming back from the party. However, Minta came. Yes, she came, Mrs. Ramsay thought, suspecting some thorn in the tangle of this thought, and disengaging it found it to be this. A woman had once accused her of robbing her of her daughter's affections. Something Mrs. Doyle had said made her remember that charge again. Wishing to dominate, wishing to interfere, making people do what she wished, that was the charge against her, and she thought it most unjust. How could she help being like that to look at? No one could accuse her of taking pains to impress. She was often ashamed of her own shabbiness. Nor was she domineering, nor was she tyrannical. It was more true about hospitals and drains and the dairy. About things like that she did feel passionately, and would, if she had the chance, have liked to take people by the scruff of their necks and make them see. No hospital on the whole island. It was a disgrace. Milk delivered at your door in London positively brown with dirt. It should be made illegal. A model dairy and a hospital up here, those two things she would have liked to do herself. But how? With all these children? When they were older, then perhaps she would have time, when they were all at school. Oh, but she never wanted James to grow a day older, or Cam either. These two she would have liked to keep for ever just as they were, demons of wickedness, angels of delight, never to see them grow up into long-legged monsters. Nothing made up for the loss. When she read just now to James, and there were numbers of soldiers with kettle-drums and trumpets. And his eyes darkened. She thought, why should they grow up and lose all that? He was the most gifted, the most sensitive of her children. But all, she thought, were full of promise. Prue, a perfect angel with the others, and sometimes now, at night especially, she took one's breath away with her beauty. Andrew. Even her husband admitted that his gift for mathematics was extraordinary. And Nancy and Roger, they were both wild creatures now, scampering about over the country all day long. As for Rose, her mouth was too big, but she had a wonderful gift with her hands. If they had charades, Rose made the dresses, made everything, liked best arranging tables, flowers, anything. She did not like it that Jasper should shoot birds but it was only a stage. They all went through stages. Why, she asked, pressing her chin on James's head, should they grow up so fast? Why should they go to school? 
she would have liked always to have had a baby. She was happiest carrying one in her arms. Then people might say she was tyrannical, domineering, masterful, if they chose. She did not mind. And, touching his hair with her lips, she thought, he will never be so happy again, but stopped herself, remembering how it angered her husband that she should say that. Still, it was true. They were happier now than they would ever be again. A tenpenny tea-set made Cam happy for days. She heard them stamping and crowing on the floor above her head the moment they awoke. They came bustling along the passage. Then the door sprang open, and in they came, fresh as roses, staring, wide awake, as if this coming into the dining-room after breakfast, which they did every day of their lives, was a positive event to them, and so on, with one thing after another, all day long, until she went up to say good-night to them, and found them netted in their cots like birds among cherries and raspberries, still making up stories about some little bit of rubbish, something they had heard, something they had picked up in the garden. They all had their little treasures. And so she went down and said to her husband, Why must they grow up and lose it all? Never will they be so happy again. And he was angry. Why take such a gloomy view of life, he said, it is not sensible. For it was odd, and she believed it to be true, that with all his gloom and desperation he was happier, more hopeful on the whole, than she was. Less exposed to human worries, perhaps that was it. He always had his work to fall back on. Not that she herself was pessimistic, as he accused her of being. Only she thought life, and a little strip of time presented itself to her eyes, her fifty years. There it was before her, life. Life, she thought. But she did not finish her thought. She took a look at life, for she had a clear sense of it there, something real, something private, which she shared neither with her children nor with her husband. A sort of transaction went on between them, in which she was on one side and life was on another, and she was always trying to get the better of it, as it was of her, and sometimes they parleyed, when she sat there alone. There were, she remembered, great reconciliation scenes, but for the most part, oddly enough, she must admit that she felt this thing she called life terrible, hostile, and quick to pounce on you if you gave it a chance. There were eternal problems—suffering, death, the poor. There was always a woman dying of cancer, even here. And yet she had said to all these children, You shall go through it all. To eight people she had said relentlessly that, and the bill for the greenhouse would be fifty pounds. For that reason, knowing what was before them, love and ambition and being wretched alone in dreary places, she had often the feeling, why must they grow up and lose it all? And then she said to herself, brandishing her sword at life, nonsense! They will be perfectly happy. And here she was, she reflected, feeling life rather sinister again, making Minta marry Paul Rayleigh, because, whatever she might feel about her own transaction, she had had experiences which need not happen to every one. She did not name them to herself. She was driven on, too quickly she knew, almost as if it were an escape for her too, to say that people must marry, people must have children. Was she wrong in this? she asked herself, reviewing her conduct for the past week or two, and wondering if she had indeed put any pressure upon Minta, who was only twenty-four, to make up her mind. She was uneasy. Had she not laughed about it? Was she not forgetting again how strongly she influenced people? Marriage needed oh, all sorts of qualities. The bill for the greenhouse would be fifty pounds. One, she need not name it, that was essential, the thing she had with her husband. Had they that? Then he put on his trousers and ran away like a madman, she read. But outside a great storm was raging, and blowing so hard that he could scarcely keep his feet. Houses and trees toppled over, the mountains trembled, rocks rolled into the sea, the sky was pitch-black, and it thundered and lightened, 
and the sea came in with black waves as high as church towers and mountains, and all with white foam at the top. She turned the page, there were only a few lines more, so that she would finish the story, though it was past bedtime. It was getting late. The light in the garden told her that, and the whitening of the flowers and something grey in the leaves conspired together to rouse in her a feeling of anxiety. What it was about she could not think at first. Then she remembered. Paul and Minta and Andrew had not come back. She summoned before her again the little group on the terrace in front of the hall door, standing looking up into the sky. Andrew had his net and basket. That meant he was going to catch crabs and things. That meant he would climb out onto a rock, he would be cut off. Or coming back, single file, on one of those little paths above the cliff, one of them might slip. He would roll and then crash. It was growing quite dark. But she did not let her voice change in the least as she finished the story, and added, shutting the book, and speaking the last words as if she had made them up herself, looking into James's eyes. And there they are, living still, at this very time. And that's the end," she said, and she saw in his eyes, as the interest of the story died away in them, something else take its place, something wandering, pale, like the reflection of a light, which had once made him gaze and marvel. Turning, she looked across the bay, and there, sure enough, coming regularly across the waves, first two quick strokes, and then one long, steady stroke, was the light of the lighthouse. It had been lit. In a moment he would ask her, "'Are we going to the lighthouse?' And she would have to say, "'No, not to-morrow. Your father says not.' Happily Mildred came in to fetch them, and the bustle distracted them. But he kept looking back over his shoulder as Mildred carried him out, and she was certain that he was thinking, "'We are not going to the lighthouse to-morrow,' and she thought, "'He will remember that all his life.' End of section 4